So let's get started. Um, I'm going to be going over some new material today about Gibbs Free Energy. And this will be the last new material for this week uh, because you have an exam on Friday. So exam three is on Friday. This is on chapters five and chapter 16 loosely. Chapter 16, I'm more of clumping together as the enthalpy work we've been doing over the past uh, like week and a half. So um, the Gibbs free energy stuff will not be on this exam. It will be on the final. And uh, your exam three will be on chapter five, which was steady and unsteady flow devices, conservation of mass, the energy equations, those things. And then um, chapter 15, and some of the work we're doing in class is on enthalpy. On Wednesday, I will be doing an exam review. Uh, I've already posted the equation sheet. Once again, there's no formula sheets. There's nothing you need to do. I'll be providing the equation sheet and the property, property tables. Um, you should be reviewing chapter five and then the work that we've been doing uh, a little bit in chapter 15, a little bit more chemistry heavy um, for the past like week and a half. Uh, the exam is on Friday in person like normal. Is there any, are there any questions? You'll be doing a, um, an exam review on Wednesday, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. Yep, on Zoom on Wednesday, I'll do an exam review. So I'll probably come with like one or two problems to work and then leave time if you guys have any specific problems you'd like me to work or any questions. Um, but I have learned that when I ask you guys to bring questions, most of the time you don't bring any. So I just make them up myself now. <laughs> Other questions? Well, then I'll ask this, what, what questions should we be, be looking for to bring you like in the back of the book, like the homework questions kind of? Um, yeah, so like any in-class activities, anything that I've worked, any homework questions that were maybe like confusing to you or oh, okay, okay. that you didn't really feel like you fully understood. Gotcha, I thought you meant like new problems. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, but like I used to do, like you guys bring questions and I'll go over what you want. And then the exam review was like 10 minutes because everyone's like, I don't know, you tell us. <laughs> so yeah, so I just make a lot now. Okay, other questions. Okay. Then um, I will get started. You have um, the equation sheet is already posted under the exam three module. You have homework six on chemical thermodynamics that will be due Friday as well. So I would you know use that as a study guide, turn that in when Thursday night, Wednesday, um, even Friday morning, and then show up for my exam at 11.30, ready to rock and roll. Um, I think... I think that um, you're probably going to be the rustiest on chapter five, because now we, we stopped doing that a couple of weeks ago and kind of totally switched topics. So definitely try to go back and start working on chapter five, like now. Chapter five is is a tough chapter, it's pretty dense and it's combining property tables, energy equations, mass conservation, uh, turbines, you know, nozzles, pipe and duct flow, heat exchangers. It's a pretty dense chapter. So make sure that you're going back to those homeworks and class activities, working the example problems in the book, working the example problems I did in class. All right. I am going to get started. So as I mentioned today, I'm gonna to be doing some new material, just introducing Gibbs free energy, and uh, this will not be on the exam. We'll pick up more with this next week. So we are looking at chemical, chemical thermodynamics still. Chemical thermodynamics. Um, no, this will not be on the exam. This is new material that is uh, kind of chapter 16, but more of just 
uh, me developing stuff from different chemical textbooks about chemical thermodynamics. So this is not on the exam. Chemical thermodynamics, and we are looking today at Gibbs free energy. So uh, Dr. Karatum did half of his PhD at Yale University where uh, Josiah Gibbs worked and was a professor. And so uh, you can actually go visit his grave up at Yale, which Dr. Karatum did and is pretty cool. But um, this guy was a amazing scientist, kind of was groundbreaking in discovering this concept of free energy, which is the uh, free energy that is available to do work. So we represent Gibbs free energy with the letter, come on, with the letter G. Typically this is going to be a delta G. And this is free energy available to do work. Free energy available to do work. Free energy available to do work. Work we've talked about um, before. So work is related to free energy. And when, when pressure is constant, when pressure is constant, then we have this equation. So delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. I am hoping that you have seen this and used this a lot in chemistry, but it's the hope that kills, you know? So this is one of the main equations for Gibbs free energy. We have several equations for Gibbs free energy, but this is one of the easiest ones. This is Gibbs free energy. This is our change in enthalpy. This is our temperature in Kelvin. So it's important that it's in Kelvin because it will always be greater than zero. You're never gonna have a negative temperature. And this delta S here is our change in entropy. Could it be Rankine too? No. It's always going to be in Kelvin. Um, yeah, it's, it's always, all of the examples we're going to be doing are in Kelvin. All right. So when Delta G is positive, we call this endogonic. Oops. Endogonic or non spontaneous. Is negative two hundred seventy four degrees Celsius possible? Um, I don't know what the threshold for the bottom of Celsius is. I know that zero Kelvin is considered to be absolute zero and it's a theoretical thing that has not really been achieved. So there's people who are researching absolute zero and they have been for a really long time, but um, it hasn't like been achieved in the lab before. We've gotten down to like 0 0.0001 Kelvin, but I don't think we've ever gotten to like absolute zero. I'm not sure what the bottom of Celsius is. I mean, it, it, it would be the same thing, right? Like negative 271.1000 or something Kelvin uh, Celsius, but we would all, just always measure it in Kelvin at that point. Um, okay, so Delta G 
positive is endogonic and non-spontaneous. Delta G negative is going to be exogonic. and considered to be spontaneous. So if delta G is zero, then we are at equilibrium. So this is more Gibbs free energy. If we have um, our Gibbs free energy of a system, this is gonna equal the summation of all the individual Gibbs free energies of the individual components. So this is similar to our enthalpy of a system is equal to the summation of the enthalpies of each of the individual components. So remember when we're like making those equations and we're adding up those enthalpies because you have these reactions to form your final compound, you add those up, right? So there, it's a summation of those enthalpies and the individual reactions. It's analogous to the way we deal with Gibbs free energy. And also analogous is the change in Gibbs free energy of a reaction is going to be the summation of Gibbs free energy of the product minus the summation of Gibbs free energy of the reactants, which is once again analogous analogous to enthalpy. Oops. Analogous to enthalpy. Wow, that got out of control there. So there's a lot of similarities between Gibbs free energy and enthalpy, but Gibbs free energy writing today gives free energy tells about spontaneity tells about spontaneity but not about heat So you can have a reaction that is exothermic and that tells you about heat. You can have a reaction that's exogonic and that tells you about spontaneity. But Gibbs free energy tells you about if the reaction will spontaneously occur, not if the reaction is going to release or absorb heat. That's what the enthalpy is for. It also doesn't tell you anything about the rate of the reaction. It just tells you if it will spontaneously occur, if it's like a naturally going to occur event. Okay, so for Gibbs free energy, the more negative, the more spontaneous. which is like enthalpy, the more negative, the more heat released, the more negative, the more spontaneous the reaction is. So 
So right now we already have two equations. We can either do delta G is equal to the products minus the reactants, delta G of the products minus delta G of the reactants. Or we can do delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. Your Gibbs free energy values will typically be tabulated. So they'll be in some table and your delta H, delta S, you can often also get from tables. Okay, obviously um, this is, this should be like, okay, duh, but you know, maybe, maybe, maybe not, maybe you haven't thought about it before. So the sign of your Delta G, if it's positive or negative, sign of Delta G depends on direction of reaction that's written. So for instance, if you wrote a reaction where these two products make this reactant, your delta G might be positive if it's written one way. And then if you reverse it, it might be negative. So it's telling you it's spontaneous in one direction and non-spontaneous in the other direction. So the sign of delta G depends on the direction that your reaction is written. So if you remember an enthalpy where we could reverse the reactions and then we had to reverse the enthalpy sign, it's the same with delta G um, written. The sign of delta G depends on the direction of reaction that's written. So whichever way your reaction is written, that's gonna influence the sign of your delta G the same way it does with your enthalpy. All right. Okay, so we have this nice table that we can make with four quadrants. And our four quadrants are when we have an enthalpy, uh, when, okay, when we have an enthalpy, a change in enthalpy that is exothermic, so less than zero, and an enthalpy that is greater than zero, so endothermic. Releasing heat or absorbing heat then we can have our change in enthalpy is positive. So increasing um, in entropy, increasing disorder, or our change in entropy is uh, uh, negative. So de like increasing order, decreasing chaos. So this is increasing entropy. This is like decreasing entropy from final to initial. <clears throat> so if we have an exothermic process that is increasing in entropy, so it's releasing heat and it has um, an increasing entropy. If we look at the equation, delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. If this is negative and this is positive, where this positive is behind a, a minus sign anyway, this reaction is going to be spontaneous. But the delta G, that is less than zero. So if this is negative 100 and this is negative 100 and our temperature is always positive, I'm sorry, if this is negative 100 and this is positive 100 and our temperature is always positive, it's gonna be you know, always negative, so spontaneous. <clears throat> All right, so if we have an endothermic reaction, 
So this, this is positive and an increasing entropy. So a positive entropy change. What will this reaction be? Spontaneous, non-spontaneous, sometimes spontaneous. What will this reaction be? Other thoughts? So this reaction will be spontaneous at high temperatures. Spontaneous at high temperatures. So either is, is generally right. <laughs> so for this, you need your T delta S um, to be large. <clears throat> so if this is positive and this is negative, if this negative is larger than this positive, then you'll get negative. So if you have a high temperature or a really, really large increase in entropy, but typically it's going to be your temperature, then your reaction is spontaneous. That's kind of why if we want things to react, uh, we heat them up. <laughs> but typically, yeah. Um, that, that has to do with rate as well. So, but at a high temperature, this reaction will be spontaneous. So what about this one? If we're exothermic, but we have decreasing entropy, will we be spontaneous, non-spontaneous or spontaneous in a certain condition? This box. Yeah, great. So this one will be spontaneous at a low temperature for the exact same reasoning, just the opposite. Spontaneous at low temps. So when our T delta S is low or like low, small. I'll mirror what I said here. So T delta S is large, T delta S is small. And then finally, if we're endothermic with decreasing entropy, are we spontaneous, non-spontaneous, or conditionally spontaneous? Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, so this is non-spontaneous. So our delta G will be greater than zero. So uh, two things to note, <clears throat> temperature, uh, temperature in Kelvin, always greater than zero. It's always going to be a positive number. This temperature will always be a non-negative. And the other note is that you can be, you can have a reaction that is both exothermic and endogonic. So which of these conditions is exothermic and endogonic? I guess that, that's kind of a hard way to say it, but you can be exothermic where your delta H is negative, but you can still be endogonic where if you have this negative, but this is too, if your delta S is also negative larger, so kind of this condition, then you can be um, endogonic. So you can have a negative delta H in exothermic and then a, still have a positive delta G. So um, 
this condition here, but not at small, not at low temps. All right. So as I stated before, we have an analogous situation to enthalpy with our delta G of our products minus delta G of our reactions equaling the delta G of our reaction. So when we're looking at standard free energy change, standard free energy change, we have our delta G with this superscript representing standard is equal to the summation of the molar amount of the change in Gibbs free energy at a standard condition of formation of the products minus the summation of the molar amount of the change in Gibbs free energy of formation at standard temperature and pressure of our reactants. So it's, it would be the exact same thing if you replace all of the Gs with Hs. So delta G subscript F superscript not. The delta representing change in Gibbs free energy. F representing Gibbs standard free energy of formation. Gibbs free energy of formation. And this superscript representing standard or at STP, at standard temperature and pressure. So to recap, your delta G standard, so this value here, tells whether a mixture of reactants and products would spontaneously react forward or reverse. Tells whether a mixture of reactants and products would spontaneously react forward where delta G is less than zero or reverse where our delta G is greater than zero. So this is a negative, this is a positive. Okay, so as an example, we have nitrogen gas in two gas reacting with hydrogen gas, actually. It's gonna make you balance it. Hydrogen gas producing ammonia gas. Find Delta G standard, assume standard temperature and pressure given, or you can find these from a table, but I'm gonna give them to you today, are chemical 
and then our delta G of formation at standard temperature and pressure for nitrogen gas, for hydrogen gas, for ammonia gas. This is an elemental compound at zero. This is an elemental compound at zero. Ammonia has a delta G of formation of negative 16.66 kilojoules per mole. So find the delta G standard. I'm gonna let you work on this for a couple of minutes and then I will do the answer. So uh, like four minutes, I'll go over it like 12.05, 12.06. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, make sure to always include units. But yeah, you're, you're right. This is an easy problem. Um, so we just have our delta G standard is equal to the delta G of formation standard of our products minus minus the delta G of formation standard of our reactants. For our products, we have our um, <laughs> ammonia and hydrogen and nitrogen. But the first thing that we need to do is make sure that this is balanced. So we have one mole of nitrogen gas to three moles of hydrogen gas to produce two moles of ammonia. So we have two moles of ammonia, which is negative 16.66 kilojoules per mole for our products, minus one mole of zero kilojoules per mole for our nitrogen gas, plus three moles of zero kilojoules per mole of our hydrogen, which all of that goes to zero and you're left with just two moles times 16.66 kilojoules per mole, which gives you negative 33.32 kilojoules as your delta G standard for that reaction. So if, if our delta G standard here is negative 33.32 kilojoules, this tells us that nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas will spontaneously react, will spontaneously react to 
to form ammonia. Okay, also ammonia, NH3, ammonium, NH4+. So this is ammonia, ammonium, NH4+. So ammonia, NH3. It doesn't tell, doesn't tell anything about rate of reaction. So these could react in an hour. These could react in three halves of a second, or this could react in 3000 years. So they will spontaneously react, but we're not given any information about the rate that reaction occurs. So just because they spontaneously react doesn't mean that it's instantaneous or that it's quick. It can be a very slow process. All right. So let's do another example. So example, what is, um, yeah, so these were at standard temperature and pressure and that's what you looked up in the table. But if these were not at standard temperature and pressure, then your delta G of formation would be different. And uh, most of these equations are only for constant pressure too. So if you have a changing pressure, then everything gets crazy. No, you will not always be given delta G of formation, but you will be um, given a table. So if I don't give it to you in the problem statement, you can look it up in a table. Yeah, I don't, you don't have to memorize them or anything, but you might have to look them up in a table. Okay, so example. <clears throat> what is the delta G for melting an ice cube in a freezer at negative 10 degrees Celsius? What is the delta G for melting in ice cube? in a freezer at negative 10 degrees Celsius. You're given delta H of melting an ice cube at 10 degrees Celsius to be 6.01 kilojoules per mole reaction. And our change in enthalpy for this melting an ice cube at negative 10 degrees to be 22.0 joules per mole reaction Kelvin. This is for the fusion of water, which is melting of ice. All right, so I'll let you work on it for a few minutes and come up with an answer.
Okay, I um, see a few people got an answer. Only one person is right so far. So I'll give you a couple more minutes to work on it. Okay, so yes, so Abed and Elizabeth on the right tracks. Emma, you're close, you just had a unit error. Um, so thanks everybody for helping. All right, so first, initially, okay, we're asked for delta G and we're given enthalpy and uh, entropy. So obviously we're gonna be using the equation, I shouldn't say obviously, so it looks like we're gonna be using the equation of change in Gibbs free energy as our change in enthalpy minus temperature times change in entropy. So we have this, we have this, and we're given this. So we can really just plug and chug. The only thing we should change first is that our temperature is given as negative 10 degrees Celsius, but this temperature should always be in Kelvin, which means we're gonna to wanna to convert it into Kelvin, which would be 263 Kelvin. So then if we plug in, we have delta G is equal to delta H, 6.01 kilojoules per mole reaction minus 263 Kelvin times 22 joules mole reaction Kelvin. But I'm gonna need to do another conversion because this is in kilojoules and this is in moles. So I'm gonna need to convert into kilojoules. So in one kilojoule, I have a thousand moles. Uh, I'm sorry, no, that's not right. Sorry, a thousand joules. I was looking at something else. So therefore this would become 0 0.022 kilojoules mole reaction Kelvin. So one, two, three. All right, so if we do this math, we have 6.01 kilojoules mole per reaction minus 5.79 kilojoules mole reaction, which gives us positive 0 0.22 kilojoules, 224 kilojoules mole reaction as our delta G. So is this endogonic or exogonic? Um, no, Emma, you could you could have converted to joules. That you could have done that. You could have as long as the unit's matching, it doesn't really matter. Unless I ask for a specific unit, you could have gone either way. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so um, this is endogonic. 
because it is positive, which means it is a non-spontaneous reaction. Does that make sense? Could you have, could you have guessed that? So at what temperature does ice melt at, you know, normal conditions, normal pressure and everything? Zero. Or 100, sorry. Uh, say that again. Oh, maybe, maybe that wasn't to me. Um, no, that's what temperature water boils. Wouldn't it be like... Like if it, if it freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or something, I don't know if that's correct, then it would be like anything above that, it would melt. Right, so what is that in Celsius? So like Kaya, what, what, what temperature does ice melt in Celsius? I'm asking Kaya because I think she grew up with Celsius. Yeah, so um, zero, right? So your freezer should be at like something like negative four degrees just to make sure like it's a little bit below zero but ice freezes at zero degrees Celsius. So below zero, ice is frozen. Between zero and 100, ice would be liquid water or melting. And then 100, it'd be boiling. So in Fahrenheit, it would be 32 degrees. So you were right, Emma. And then what, 212 is boiling. Um, so if we are trying to melt ice at negative 10 degrees Celsius, it's not, that's not going to work. That's not going to be spontaneous. This is a non-spontaneous reaction. You're not going to have that ice going through a fusion reaction to melt. It's not at the right temperature. So if we were to change this temperature to something more like 40 degrees Celsius, and this value went higher. So instead of 263, we had something like 313, then this value would now be higher than our change in enthalpy and we would be a negative delta G and it would be a spontaneous reaction. So the fact that we're at a temperature that's less than zero, so less than 273, causes us to have that switch into being endogonic and non-spontaneous. Um, so Levi, endogonic is referring to delta G and that is telling us if, if something is spontaneous or non-spontaneous. Exothermic and endothermic are telling us if it releases or absorbs heat. So if we come back to this table, you can have a, something that is exothermic, it's releasing heat, but also endogonic. So if you have this reaction here, just because you have something that's exothermic based on your enthalpy, so the reaction could be releasing heat the way that you've written it. It might never proceed that way because it's not gonna be spontaneous that way. So uh, for instance, if this value is too much bigger, um, then you're too much bigger negative, which would switch it to positive, then you can have an endo endogonic reaction, which means that it's non-spontaneous. So you can be emitting heat and also be a non-spontaneous reaction. So endothermic, exothermic refers to enthalpy, endogonic, exogonic refers to spontaneity and gives free energy. Um, one way to remember it, like the way I think of it is if it's like exothermic or endothermic, like therm is temperature, thermal, and then endogonic and exogonic, like if you think of it as like gone, like how it'll undergo the reaction, I guess, like, yeah, spontaneous. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Emma. I should have said that. I think of that too, because like therm is a unit of like heat measurement, like thermal, therm. Okay, that's like temperature. And then for endogonic and exergonic, I think like it in gonna go endogonic, or I expect it to go. I expect it's gonna go. Like endogonic, it in gonna go. I don't know why I do that, but um, yeah. So like going endo going, like it's it's not gonna end up going exogonic. I expect that it'll go. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks, Emma. I love like sayings like that and like little mnemonics and like memorizing things. I just love them. So if anybody has any, please interrupt me and tell me them any time of my life. All right, any questions about these kind of simple reactions? Okay, um, I'm still making the exam, but I will warn you, I have put in, I have put something at the top of the exam and I'm standing by it. 
If your units are wrong, I'm taking off five points. And if your answer is not boxed, I'm taking off five points. So on the exam, your answer needs to be boxed with the correct units, because I think units are extremely important. You can figure out what units you're supposed to have based on the question. So you can read the question and then write what units you're supposed to have, right? So whatever, kilojoule per mole, or uh, if it's a mass flow rate, kilograms per second. You can figure out your units that you're supposed to have. And then I want you to be boxing your answer because some of the grading has just gotten a little out of control. I've been pretty lenient about it, but you need to be boxing your answer, which includes your units. And this right there, make sure that you're not losing 10 points. If you just do this, 3.3. Or 3.3, um, I think maybe like kilojoules, I don't know. Then you're gonna lose 10 points. Even if this is kind of right, you're still gonna lose 10 points because I'm just becoming a stickler about it. So you need a boxer answer and you need to have the right units for the upcoming exam. Most of you are really good about doing that. You're good on the homework. Um, I don't think it'll be an issue, but just keep that in mind. Yeah, circled is okay. Even if you underline it, like I'll, I'll probably accept that, but as long as I can clearly see what your answer is and what your units are, because some, some of what's happened is a couple of you have worked the problem in two different ways and you're just seeing if you can get one of them right and you don't box the answer. So I'm like, okay, well, I guess the right answer is over here. So I'll give it to him like it's here, but then you've actually worked it in two different ways and you don't actually know which one is right. So that's why I'm like, okay, you have to box your answer. Um, or circled is okay too. Okay. So I'm going to do another example and then we're going to go. So here's another example. So we have nitrous oxide gas reacting with oxygen gas to form nit wait, nit nitric oxide gas reacting with oxygen gas to form nitrous oxide gas. And the delta H of this reaction is negative 120 kilojoules per mole reaction. And the delta S of this reaction is negative 150 kilojoules per mole of this reaction. At what temperature will this reaction be spontaneous? At what temperature? Will this reaction be spontaneous? So at what temperature will this reaction be spontaneous? I'll let you work on it for like five minutes and then I will go over it. Oh, hold on. I made a mistake. The Delta S is once again given in joules not kilojoules. Okay. So work on it in a few minutes. I will be right back.
Okay, so once you get an answer, please just type it in the chat so I can see how many people need more time. Bless you. Okay, so it seems like a few people have gotten the answer. Does anybody need more time? Okay, so I'm assuming nobody needs more time. I'll go ahead. All right, so we have nitrous oxide, no, nitric oxide reacting with oxygen to form nitrous oxide. So to balance this equation, we can just do a two and a two. Pretty easy. Um, remember, balancing the equation, balancing an equation doesn't mean that you anything affects your Gibbs or enthalpy or anything. It's really only when you're trying to do that equation manipulation and you're multiplying everything by two or dividing or whatever. Just balancing doesn't affect anything. Equations should always be balanced. So at what temperature will this reaction be spontaneous? So we know that we have a Gibbs free energy change is equal to our enthalpy change minus our temperature times our entropy change. And we're trying to find the temperature in which this Gibbs free energy flips from positive to negative. So spontaneous meaning a negative delta G. So we want to find out where it flips to that from zero into negative. So we're going to find the upper threshold of when delta G is equal to zero, and then say anything less than this or anything more than this is when our delta G is going to be uh, negative. So therefore we can have this delta G, we're going to look for when it's zero. And then we have our delta H of negative 120 kilojoules moles per reaction minus our temperature, which is an unknown right now, uh, but we're solving for when Gibbs free energy is zero. 
So zero and below, so zero to negative. And then our delta S, which is negative 150 joules mole reaction. Uh, I'm gonna convert my joules to kilojoules again. So one kilojoule is a thousand joules. And you get, then get negative 120 kilojoules moles reaction minus temperature times 0 0.15 kilojoules moles. Oh, I'm sorry, this should be moles reaction Kelvin, like last time. I messed up that whole unit there, moles reaction Kelvin. So then if we move the 120 over, divide by 0 0.15, we get our temperature has to be uh, 800 degrees Kelvin. So is it anything less than, um, yeah, you're right. And this is negative. Ooh, I'm going downhill right now. I'm, I'm really hungry. I can hear my stomach growling. I ate breakfast early. Um, so my temperature is 800 degrees Kelvin. So is it anything less than this? Anything more than this? Less. Okay, does everybody agree? Anything less than this? Okay. Um, so if we're at 800 degrees Kelvin here, then that 800 degrees is where we, uh, so our, 800 degrees Kelvin is where this reaction turns to be positive. So if we were to go up to above 800, then this, this term here becomes a larger positive term than this term. So right now we have negative 120 minus, and then it would be, um, you know, temperature times negative 0.15. So once we get to 800, this, this value here, the TS becomes a greater positive value than this negative 120. So it's anything less than 800 degrees Kelvin. So anything less, which um, 800 degrees Kelvin is very, very, very hot. That's a high temperature. So pretty much this reaction is gonna be um, spontaneous at most temperatures, but that 800 degrees is where we switch from being spontaneous to non-spontaneous. So anything below 800 degrees is gonna be spontaneous. Anything above 800 degrees is gonna be non-spontaneous. What if we are at 800 degrees Kelvin? Are we spontaneous or non-spontaneous? Yeah, great. So if you're at 800 degrees Kelvin, you are at equilibrium. So your Delta G would be zero. So you're at equilibrium. <clears throat> would it be correct for me to write this with a standard symbol? Why not? Right, so inherently I'm not at standard temperature and pressure, right? I'm at 800 degrees Kelvin or whatever temperature. So remember this is referring to standard temperature and pressure. We are assuming here that we're just at a standard pressure. We're at like a basic one ATM or whatever. That's an assumption that we're making for all of these project problems, but we're not assuming standard temperature and pressure because we have a changing temperature that's not at STP. Okay. Um, I don't wanna start on the next round of new material, especially since the exam is Friday. So I think I'm gonna end here. Are there any questions about Gibbs free energy so far? Anything that we've been covering um, up till now? Any, any questions about anything? Um, I don't know if you already said this, but do you know how many questions will be on the exam? I think there's gonna be four or five. I'm still making the exam. Right now I just have one question written. <laughs> um, and it's on chapter five. So I'm, um, I'm prob probably gonna have two questions from chapter five and either two from 
enthalpy or three from enthalpy because sometimes they can be really pretty easy. So I'm, I'm still working on that, but most likely two from chapter five, two on enthalpy. <clears throat> Other questions? All right, well then with that, have a good rest of your Monday and uh, please start studying for the exam on Friday. It will be in person, like always in the room. Um, yeah, so probably two on chapter five, two on chapter 15, maybe three on chapter 15, depending on if one is really easy or not. But probably equally weighted between chapter five and chapter 15. When I say chapter five, I mean chapter five from the book. When I say chapter 15, I mean enthalpy because we did, we skipped a lot of that chapter, like the mass fuel ratio and some of the um, energy equations and things. It was very focused on combustion and we did more basic enthalpy equations. So really more um, in-class activities, lessons from the lecture, um, but just generally chapter five compounds as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so there's no egg extra credit this time. Um, I love beefy more than I love eggs, but I don't really feel like that's going to be something easy to dress up as. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I do really love popcorn, but we don't need any more dressing up. <laughs> yeah. Well, he already has like a whole basket of toys. He just got some new Easter toys too. He's spoiled. We'll see. We'll see at the end of the semester if there's any bribing that can be done. So, um, all right. Well, have a good rest of your Monday and let me know if you have any questions about anything. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.